Thank you very much. I want to talk about a specific hepatitis today, hepatitis C. Um, but first of all, who am I? So gastroenterology and hepatology is liver and guts. Okay, so I'm a doctor that looks after patients with liver and gut diseases. I spend half my time at Nine Wells looking after patients and the other half of my time teaching and doing research. And I want to talk about a specific part of my research today around hepatitis C. But first, some time travel. Let's go back to 1989. I had dark hair. It was all full. Uh, I was a very junior doctor. And I knew there were three hepatitises. There was hepatitis A, there was hepatitis B, and there was non-A, non-B hepatitis. And it was a relatively unimportant thing. It got three lines at the bottom of the page of the textbook saying it was a transfusion-related problem. When you had a blood transfusion, a few patients got this mild illness afterwards, and some of them got persistent abnormalities in their liver tests. And that was it, okay? Now, in 1989, scientists working at the Chiron Corporation and collaborating with CDC in Atlanta, Georgia, the Center for Disease Control, cloned the hepatitis C genome. So we discovered the genetic code for this virus, and non-A, non-B hepatitis became hepatitis C. So we'd never, grow, we'd never touched the virus, we'd never captured it, but we had its genetic code and therefore knew the disease. So this is the first disease we'd ever used genetics to identify. So an exciting technical breakthrough. But it's a mild disease, it doesn't matter. The genome allowed us to identify proteins from the virus, and we could therefore use those proteins to find the antibodies that our bodies produced <laughs> against it. So the antibodies were not protective against the virus, but they did give us diagnostic markers. We then started to use those diagnostic markers to explore. And we then discovered that almost all the idiopathic cirrhosis, all the cirrhosis and liver failure that we didn't have a cause for, was caused by hepatitis C. Suddenly, not such a mild disease. We looked at our transfusion patients that had been followed up for 20 and 30 years by this stage who didn't have hepatitis A or hepatitis B, and they all turned out to have hepatitis C, but by 20 or 30 years, large numbers of them had developed cirrhosis of the liver and were starting to die of liver failure. Not such a mild, unimportant disease. We then started to look at people who inject drugs uh, recreationally, and 40 to 80% of those were infected with hepatitis C. That's 1% of the Scottish population, 50,000 people. So you've got to remember that your archetype of a junky drug addict is not accurate. Most people will experiment with drugs and move on and move away and go back into society. So it's a much larger problem than we believe. And worldwide, there are 180 million people infected with this virus. So I've been told to give you a health warning. So shut your eyes now. I'll tell you whether to open them or not. So that one drop of blood from that infected patient with hepatitis C has 1.5 million copies of the virus in that drop of blood. Okay? And so the virus is spread by blood-to-blood -blood contact. So if that drop of blood gets through your skin or your skin becomes leaky, as Sarah talked about earlier on, that's how it gets into your virus. That's how it's spread. So it's spread in the same way as hepatitis B and HIV. But hepatitis C is particularly well spread by blood because it can survive in dried blood for much longer than the other ones and isn't so easily spread by sexual contact. So the main methods of transmission have been through vaccination and the reuse of needles. So doctors and nurses have been responsible for it for half a century or more and by the reuse of knives and needles, etc. And clearly blood transfusion. Now, because of the revolution in medical practice, we've removed that as a cause of current infection, but historically that's driven it. But also the use of intravenous drugs for recreational purposes through the 60s and 70s and 80s have driven a lot of the infection. So those are the sorts of people that we are thinking about infected with hepatitis C. Worldwide, you can see the areas in red have the highest prevalence. The areas in grey, we don't know, and the areas in green, the lowest prevalence. So Northern Europe, the UK, have relatively low prevalence at about 1%. Uh, Egypt is up at 20% of the population are infected. Um, the World Health Organization tried to eradicate a disease called schistosomiasis. Unfortunately, they arrived with not enough needles and reused them, and they spread it throughout the population. So where did it come from originally? We think it originated in <laughs> sub-Saharan Africa. How do we know that? Well, there are lots of different types of hepatitis C virus. 
and they're all cousins and brothers and sisters. And if you use phylogenetics to work backwards, the virus probably emerged as one core virus or was endemic in one area about 1,500 years ago. And the two candidates areas are Sub-Saharan Africa or Southeast Asia. And we're uncertain if the trade routes across those two areas allowed it to spread earlier. Whether it stayed in humans at that stage or moved from horses or dogs is open to debate. So we don't know whether it was always a human virus or it crossed into us from animals. But that's where it came from. So what happens when you get a hepatitis C infection? If you get the acute infection, it is a silent infection. Almost always it's asymptomatic. You have no symptoms, no clues that you've got it. And about 20% of patients will spontaneously cure themselves without any problems. 70 to 80% will go on and develop a chronic infection. And over 20 to 30 years, they will get large numbers of them will develop cirrhosis of the liver. This is liver failure. The liver becomes scarred. You don't have enough liver to do what it's supposed to do. And you go into liver failure, which is my bread and butter day job. And once you've developed that, you also have a significant risk of developing hepatocellular carcinoma and liver cancer. So what can we do about this? This is the structure, the top of that, this graph is the um, structure of the gene structure and the next line down are the three other proteins that the gene structure produces and there are three key proteins, the protease, the, protease, the NS5A complex and the polymerase and these three proteins allow the virus to replicate and we have now developed drugs that block every single one of these proteins. Okay, so since 1989 to about three years ago, we developed those drugs and they are now widely available for use. And Tayside and NHS Dundee and the University of Dundee has been involved in the validation and the use of those drugs. So what does that allow us to do? So if you think about hepatitis C therapy from back in the early 19. Or late 1980s when we first discovered it, we used interferon to treat the virus, which was six to 12 months of therapy with low chances of cure. We then started to get these new drugs in 2011 and that put the cure rate up to about 75%. And since 2014, 2013, a combination of two or three of those specific drugs without any interferon will cure 97 to 100% of patients. So a huge therapeutic breakthrough, brilliantly powerful tools. But having good tools is no use unless you use them appropriately if you want to kill a disease. So we can now take this virus on and we could potentially eliminate it. But how do we think about doing that? First of all, this is modelling work we did with the Scottish Government back in 2005 when we were starting to plan how we were going to cope with the hepatitis C problem that we were facing because we'd worked out its natural history. The green slime you can see in the middle was the slither of impact we were going to have if we carried on using the treatment we had then in the way that we were using it. So it was going to make no impact in the numbers of patients that were going to develop liver failure and die. And at the time we did the modelling in 2005, hepatitis C was already the leading cause of transplantation in the UK. So it was the biggest cause of liver disease already at that stage. And it was overtaking alcohol as a cause for liver transplantation. And that was before the large cohorts of patients who'd acquired the infection in the 1980s got old enough to get cirrhosis. So we were treating hepatitis C to prevent that mass of liver failure and liver cancer. And so it was going to be a perpetual program of treatment unless we improved prevention. And we'd clearly sorted out our problem with our blood, blood supply and medical use of needles. But intravenous drug use was going to continue to drive new infections unless we improve prevention. And needle exchanges and methadone programs, which had been good enough to curb the HIV epidemic, didn't work for hepatitis C to the same efficacy. So we needed to start thinking about using treatment as prevention. So because we haven't got a vaccine and we won't get a vaccine for reasons that are too long and involved to explain to you today. And if we can think about treatment as prevention, we can start to think about eradicating this disease and making it disappear from our society. Where is the disease? This is more mapping work that we've done looking at where it was. And these are the 20 postcode sectors in Scotland that have 95% of the hepatitis C patients in them. And these are the 20 most deprived postcode sectors in Scotland. And that comes as no surprise. But if you're going to use a treatment as prevention strategy, there are challenges compared to conventional medical practice. Treatment is most effective if it's delivered to the most risky and most vulnerable patients. And that means not waiting for them to stabilize. It means not waiting for them to turn up to you in clinic. It means not waiting for them to behave in the way that doctors expect patients to behave. 
It means tackling groups and bringing patients to treatment rather than, um, or rather than patients coming to treatment, which is a different way of looking at things. It's important to realise that society is looking for treatment in this case to prevent transmission rather than the patient looking for treatment and wanting a problem solved and coming to you to solve it, which is the way we normally provide healthcare. So it's a reverse of the way that it normally works, which means that the patient is not prioritising that treatment and it isn't necessarily top of their agenda to get stuff done about. And the particular patient <coughs> groups that we need to tackle have extensive experience of healthcare services and it's all been bad. It's the junkie in the corner, the dirty drug addict. And they know that experience of their healthcare. And they don't want to come because they know they're going to have an unpleasant experience when they do. And that's part of the problem that we have to overcome. And within their own community, once they're known to have hepatitis C, they become regarded as dirty and someone that you won't share with or go anywhere near because you, other people want to try and avoid having it. So there's a disincentive to having a test done in the first place. So my peers regard the idea of treating um, drug users as impossible, that you cannot do it, and I'm going to show you in the next few slides that you can. And I've always quite liked a bit of madness. <laughs> so let's think about social networks of drug use, etc. So this is a map. Every dot on the, map on the map is a person, and every line is a connection that they've shared some aspect of their drug-injecting paraphernalia or, or uh, equipment with. So if we think about um, Bruce, because this is Australian data, my friend Margaret Hellard lent me the slide. Um, and if Bruce has the infection and we cure him, and Bruce's partner, Sheila, uh, doesn't have the infection, if we cure him before she gets it, then we've got a cure rate of 200%. So we've cured two patients for the price of one. That's good, isn't it? If we come down to Gary here, there are 82 people who are linked to Gary in that big sharing network. If we therefore cure Gary, just as he gets the infection before he passes it through the rest of the network, we get an 8,100% SVR. So if you're going to invest in treatment of one patient, you then don't have to invest in treatment of the other 81 patients. So suddenly, the health economics and the managers of the health services like this idea, because it suddenly starts to cut off the epidemic at its root, going right down to the very roots of the problem. But we need a suitable test to try and make this happen because getting a test and getting a diagnosis is difficult. If you've got difficult veins because they've all been damaged because of your social activity, trying to get a blood test is difficult and it means sending patients up to get those tests. So we developed dry blood spot testing where you drop a drop of blood on the spots and it gives you the answer as to your diagnosis. Using that, we started to go out into the needle exchanges and other places to do these tests, and they were enthusiastically taken up there, and it showed that we could contact a group of patients who had, over five years, a 100% chance of acquiring the hepatitis C virus. So they were clearly interacting with people who were actively transmitting. So we had a good test, we had good treatment, and we'd now shown that we could access patients who were transmitting the virus, so we could get to the group of patients that we needed to tackle to treat. We developed a model to look at how the virus would move through that population so we could then sort of mathematically predict how much treatment we'd need to do. And if you look at the, this complicated graph, the left hand, as you're looking at it, the left hand Edinburgh group, we had to use Edinburgh because people didn't know where Dundee was for the paper. Um, <laughs> if you look at the model, um, they will now, believe me, um, if you treat between 20 and 40 per thousand drug users per year for 10 to 15 years, you'll reduce the prevalence of hepatitis C by over 90%. I don't like waiting 15 years for things. So we've developed a series of treatment pathways, some of which are research trials, some of which are standard pathways, that we can bring these patients into treatment in varieties of ways. And I don't have time to describe those in detail, but novelty testing and treatment pathways in pharmacies, which don't involve doctors at all. So the pharmacist is entirely the total uh, provider of care for the patient because they're in contact with them through methadone. And delivery of treatment in, within the needle exchanges directly, where we're not asking patients to move anywhere else, have been the two key developments that have allowed us to move forward in this way. So what's going to happen in Tayside this year, starting this month, is an extinction-level event. So we are going to treat enough very active drug users, PWIDs, to reduce the prevalence from about 30 to 40% to less than 10% over two years. So rather than waiting 15 years and retreating a lot of patients, we're going to have a massive event to bring it down. 
that will bring down the, the, the incident or the prevalence of virus so low that your chances of bumping into someone hepatitis C positive during your career as a drug user becomes less than one in a hundred. So you have less than 1% chance of acquiring the virus. And that's not enough for the virus to keep replicating and to keep spreading, so it will disappear. So after the two years, we will then have a monitoring phase where we will watch what happens. And by 2023, Tayside will be free of hepatitis C. A global first. Thank you.